I think we can start. It's it's a ten past five. It is. Um, uh, Bakut and I are uh, co-chairing this session, but uh, we have been uh, asked uh, by the organizers to uh, be sure that it's active. And so we really encourage your participation. Um, there was a comment yesterday that uh, uh, most, many of the panels have been very quiet. Uh, we want to change that around and make it lively. So uh, we will do our, uh, our introductions, but then um, we really will make this an interactive uh, discussion. One of the things, though, before I begin is just to uh, go over some housekeeping things. Uh, please be sure that your comments are brief, uh, that you have your mic on mute until you're called upon to talk. Uh, we have both the Q&A and the chat function, and both Bakut and I will be monitoring that and we'll recognize you uh, as quickly as we can. But uh, let's make this an active uh, participation uh, and an enjoyable session. It's called Do's and Don'ts in Choosing an Arbitral Seat in the CIS. Um, I thought that before we get into the very specifics of uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and other places, that uh, we should talk about um, the, the beginning, which is uh, what is a seat and why is it important? So if we can flip to that first si side. Uh, oh, good. Uh, the seat is the home base of the arbitration. It, it's the thing that locks the arbitration into a, a context. Its laws govern the procedural aspects of the arbitration and supplement the rules of the arbitration authority if that arbitration is administered. Uh, the laws of the seat largely govern the process of and rights relating to the enforcement of the arbitration award. So that is uh, an important aspect. And the next slide. Um, the courts of the seat have supervisory authority over the arbitration. Its courts can be arbitration friendly, that is they can offer support uh, to the tribunal or the parties, or on the negative side they can be intrusive and restrict the arbitration process. This is why um, it is uh, very important in choosing the seat to uh, have a very good understanding of the jurisprudence in that location to know whether it's, uh, it's going to be arbitration friendly or whether it's going to be intrusive and in effect prohibit the arbitration. And challenges to an award can be heard in the courts of the seat. Um, as you know, uh, Article 5.1e of the New York Convention makes this explicit. It says that uh, recognition and enforcement of an award may be refused if the award has been set aside or suspended by a competent authority of the country in which, or under the laws of which, that award was made. So there you have it. The, uh, the New York Convention expressly looks to the seat for this, the, the question of challenges to an award. Um, but many people confuse the seat with where the hearing uh, must be held. Most often that is the case, that, that the hearing will be held at the seat but it isn't necessarily the case. It can be held for convenience in any other location. But the seat is this uh, home, so to speak, for the arbitration. And we want to do that first uh, because uh, we're going to get into the question of why is it important uh, to look carefully at the jurisprudence of the various locations before selecting where you're going to go. And the reason is that uh, it is important. Uh, as I've mentioned, challenges can be can only be held uh, in the courts of the seat. And more importantly, if you have an unfriendly uh, jurisdiction, you're going to have a terrible time uh, conducting the arbitration. The court will come in and perhaps prevent you from doing the arbitration. Uh, on the other hand, if you have an arbitration friendly seat, you can expect that if you need assistance, interim measures, for example, you, you can go to the courts of the of the seat and get those interim measures. Um, so now having set the stage that uh, it is important to, uh, to consider the seat and not overlook it, uh, I, I'm reminded of the fact that yesterday uh, Natalia Todd uh, at the introductory session presented a case involving Anka, a Turkish construction company, uh, and in the arbitration clause, uh, uh, there was no uh, determination of the seat. 
And so there was, in a sense, a battle between the courts in London and the courts in Moscow as to whether uh, the seat was uh, London or the seat was Moscow. And uh, a great deal of things turned on that. Uh, and it was perhaps an oversight in the draftsman of that particular contract, that particular arbitration clause, to avoid uh, or, or to overlook the fact uh, of selecting the seat. And um, I must say, one of the parties must have been very unhappy to find that um, its intention of having the seat in Moscow was in effect overruled by a court, by the London court. And I think that um, it just shows that even in very sophisticated contracts, people can overlook this issue of selecting the seat. So it is important. And now I'm going to turn this over to Bakhut to take us into the CIS and we'll begin a discussion of um, the pros and cons, the do's and the don'ts in selecting a seat in the CIS. And again, I encourage uh, all of you who are on this uh, call, we now have 20 participants, to come in and step in and uh, we'll hear your comments as well. But first, Bakhut. Okay. Uh... Thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining uh, this um, the session. Um, before I start my section, I just wanted to make sure that uh, you know, all of you, uh, that, that, that you know that uh, you are all panelists and you can turn on your microphone um, uh, if you would like to speak uh, and uh, share your experiences. The idea is to have a just a discussion and maybe share your experiences as to uh, whether you have one uh, in, in the CIS. Um, my part of the presentation, you know, uh, concerns with um, Kazakh law and um, uh, maybe some thoughts from my colleagues who work in, in Central Asia. Um, and, you know, uh, when we prepared this presentation, uh, we discussed with Peter as to, as to potential factors which could impact uh, uh, doing an arbitration in the CIS. And uh, my, my personal observation is that... Um, it, it looks like um, extreme cases uh, uh, are probably uh, in the past. Um, it, my, my overall feeling is that uh, jurisdictions like Kazakhstan and, and Russia are being uh, friendlier to uh, arbitration. And, um, um, but still, you have to be careful when you choose uh, a jurisdiction in the CIS as to, uh, from, from the perspective of local arbitration law. For example, um, um, you have to be careful uh, about weird requirements of the local law. For example, in, in the Kazakh arbitration law, we have uh, a requirement to obtain state's consent uh, or uh, consent from the quasi-state entities, uh, entities which belong to the state, state companies, uh, to arbitrate disputes. So basically, they have to get a consent from, uh, from their re regulating authority to enter into an arbitration agreement. And because you are uh, doing the arbitration in, in the jurisdiction in Kazakhstan, for example, you are subject to this Kazakh local arbitration law and a failure to obtain such consent would uh, simply make entire arbitration meaningless. Uh, and the, the, another weird thing is that I haven't heard of anyone obtaining this consent from the state. <laughs> So effectively, this is just a, just a polite way of saying that uh, state entities will not arbitrate disputes. Of course, this is um, avoided by uh, simply uh, arbitrating a dispute uh, outside of Kazakhstan. But again, uh, there are um, concerns that this rule concerns with the right of, of a state company to arbitrate. It's not just a procedural uh, requirement. So it can potentially lead to invalidity, um, the failure to enforce a, a foreign arbitral award if, it, uh, uh, if someone seeks enforcement of it in, in, in our jurisdictions. So you have to really be careful about local law. So yeah, I guess one of the easiest ways to avoid risks like this is probably go somewhere outside of the, of the CIS to try to arbitrate. But if you are uh, kind of uh, comfortable with things like this, or if your dispute is relatively simple, I think uh, the CIS could be a relatively safe place to maybe arbitrate a, a dispute. Um, I haven't heard of, uh, you know, some really outrageous uh, cases like before, like 10 years ago, where a local court would uh, entirely cancel an, an arbitral award for no valid reason. We've, I've just done uh, a statistical research on, uh, on cancellations um, by local Kazakh courts of arbitral awards. And uh, our observation is that about 95% of those uh, cancellations concerned with failure to notify uh, a party to the arbitral proceedings. 
and mostly in co it concerns with uh, small um, local arbitral institutions, which which was a popular practice in Russia as well until recently. As I understand, in Russia, they um, limited the scope of arbitral institutions and um, to avoid this same situation, but we still have it. So basically, you can have a, a bunch of maybe tens, hundreds of small arbitral institutions which can issue whatever judgment they want, and they can be created un uh, under a specific bank or maybe financial organizations to issue whatever judgments that they require. So uh, most cancellations concerned with them. Uh, but I, I, uh, I mean, it's very rare when some established uh, local arbitral institutions, arbitral award is canceled. It's really very rare. Uh, in terms of arbitrability, uh, it's relatively straightforward. It, it concerns with all matters which uh, are considered to, to fall within civil law matters. Uh, well, obviously, bankruptcy doesn't fall into this uh, uh, corporate disputes fall into this, um, uh, we haven't had problems with corporate disputes. There might be issues with uh, disputes relating to the right to real estate, uh, because under Kazakh civil procedure law, and, and the same thing I think uh, existed in Russia as well. I, I don't know if there have been any developments uh, since then. Um, it falls into exclusive jurisdiction of the local courts to decide to resolve disputes related to rights for to real estate. Uh, so there you can have issues. Um, um, and again, uh, uh, behavior of local state courts, um, it's relatively, uh, well, it's not too common when local courts uh, grant injunctive relief in aid of uh, ongoing arbitrations, but uh, I wouldn't say that the situation is really so bad. Sometimes you get it. So, um, uh, well, you do not get too much support, but uh, I don't know, uh, Peter, uh, uh, oh, could you give examples of uh, what kind of state um, uh, support from state courts you usually require during an arbitration, for example? Well, I think uh, there, there are discovery issues. Uh, there are also uh, interim measures that uh, have to be taken. I mean, clearly, uh, an arbitral tribunal doesn't have the power to enjoin somebody from doing something. Uh, you, you may have a question of, uh, of documents that... Um, uh, could be uh, taken out of the jurisdiction or, or uh, you, you also have um, issues of uh, being able to get witnesses, uh, subpoena power, things like that. Uh, you okay. really need the court. So uh, the, the question uh, again is, is whether you can go to the court, whether you can expect the court to grant uh, an interim measure that is necessary to continue your arbitration. Okay. Well, in, in our experience, we rarely do that, maybe just because uh, it doesn't make sense doing that with a Kazakh court because you won't be able to get that kind of support, maybe. <laughs> uh, the maximum thing you can get is maybe injunctive relief if, if you're lucky. Um, uh, others, I'm not sure. Maybe there, are Kaz uh, maybe there are colleagues from Kazakhstan who could also uh, share their experience. Um, um, in terms of Belt and Road, um, uh, I haven't heard of uh, uh, Belt and Road pro uh, projects um, being uh, subject to mandatory Chinese um, um, ar arbitration. Uh, have you heard of anything of it? I haven't heard really. We, as you know, the, the Belt and Road is a, uh, it's been reported to be a $7 trillion project over, over many, many years. It's certainly not defined uh, very uh, tightly, but um, and it, it certainly is going to have a great impact in Kazakhstan and other uh, parts of Central Asia as China cr tries to create a, or is in the process of creating infrastructure to be able to move its products uh, from China to Europe and beyond. And uh, as we all know, construction contracts are rife with disputes and um, we can expect that uh, over time, there'll be many, many uh, disputes arising out of these contracts. And the, the question I have is uh, whether, for example, a, a project in, let's say, Kazakhstan, uh, a dispute arises, whether there is some sort of mandatory feature that requires that contract dispute to be resolved in China as distinct from being resolved in Kazakhstan. Well, you know, I really haven't heard of that. Um, what I know that usually uh, Chinese clients, uh, well, of course they insist on China, but uh, usually most of those disputes, they end up some, somewhere in Hong Kong. But I really haven't heard of anyone being really required to uh, accept, for example, the jurisdiction of Sea Attack. Mm -hmm. um, I could ask the, the uh, 
the 24 who are participating in this session, does anyone have any experience uh, in this regard with, with Belt and Road? All of you can speak. Uh, you can turn on your microphone. I've uh, transferred you into co-panelists. All right, well, it is a, it's a fairly new thing. Uh, I, I think we should, at least I will certainly, and I'm sure Bakup will keep uh, our eyes on this because uh, uh, we can expect that there will be a great deal of activity in Belt and Road and that um, construction contracts do give rise to disputes. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. You know, um, when I was uh, preparing for this presentation, um, for the session, I um, tried to understand what is the scope of issues that you can have, I mean, risks which you can have in, in a local jurisdiction uh, like Kazakhstan or maybe um, uh, a larger CIS. And uh, the uh, general observation is that um, main issues are uh, with enforcement. Uh, and uh, uh, and the risk of uh, having the the award set aside by the local court. Um, so uh, there is a quick fix uh, in in Kazakhstan to that. And some of you probably have heard about the Astana International Financial Center. Um, you know, it's it, uh, well, the Kazakh government did not decide to. They decided to do a shortcut. They didn't want to change the entire judicial system and you know spend a lot of time trying to reform it and uh, clean up and, 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 and things like that. They simply set up uh, the IFC and they said uh, anyone can uh, submit their disputes to the uh, EIFC arbitration or AFC court. Um, and uh, we will hire uh, judges from England and uh, they will try cases based on English law or AFC law based on uh, principles of English law or whatever law you choose, it can be Kazakh law as well. And the main benefit of the AIFC court from, uh, from dispute resolution perspective in AIFC arbitration is that uh, a judgment or uh, issued by AIFC court uh, is considered to be a local judgment uh, is equal to a Kazakh court judgment. And um, uh, arbitral proceedings held within the framework of IFC are uh, subject to the exclusive jurisdiction in terms of uh, cancellation of the award in, in terms of enforcement are subject to the AIFC court. So uh, basically, only the AFC court can uh, has the right to um, uh, oversee uh, the uh, arbitral proceedings within the AFC court. And because the AFC court is uh, composed of English judges, you would not expect uh, any hostility towards arbitration uh, during proceedings there. So, uh, so uh, there are examples when it was tested. Uh, so far, so good. Um, but the, it looks like the. Uh, uh, major issues associated with enforcement and um, in uh, ca cancellation of the arbitral award once it is, uh, it is issued are fixed by the system. Uh, so if you submit there, for example, you could have a dispute between a Chinese company and a Russian company, for example, if you need a, a neutral seat, then you could potentially submit to AFC, except for the minus 40 degrees centigrade in winter, uh, <laughs> overall it should be fine. Uh, and, and that award will have a, um, uh, will be equal to a Kazakh state judgment uh, if you're seeking, if, for example, it's a, it's a construction project in Kazakhstan, then it will have a similar effect and you will not risk uh, the, 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 that it's going to be uh, refused recognition or enforcement. So um, this is the kind of thing. And, and, and as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the good thing is that it gives you flexibility. Uh, you are not supposed to choose EIFC law because there have been many issues about um, the, the, the practice, uh, judicial practice associated with the application of AIFC law because it's too new. So you can submit whatever law you want uh, and have it tried by uh, the judges or uh, the arbitrators. Uh, Baku, did, did you have any uh, statistics on uh, how many cases have been submitted either to the AIFC court or uh, to arbitration at the AIFC? Well, uh, you know, th th they publish on their site that they have uh, overall 197 uh, to this date uh, mediation arbitration cases. Uh, how many of them are uh, arbitration cases, I, I don't know, because arbitrations are confidential. We really do not know how many of them uh, uh, kind of are complete uh, at which stage. Um, we know only of maybe a couple of cases uh, tried by the court, uh, by the AFC court. 
um, uh, and th this uh, statistics is publicly available, um, but uh, there's really no information on the arbitration. But we are actively introducing AFC arbitration clauses into our contracts with clients. Now, uh, two questions. Are the court, the AIFC court, are those hearings public? Yes, uh, they are public. Uh, there are, if I'm not mistaken, nine uh, judges I'm from England. They sit uh, and uh, well, basically, they, they are very similar. Uh, the AFC court and uh, AFC arbitration, except that if you submit to the AFC court, uh, you are automatically subject to AFC law unless you opt out of the AFC law. Uh, and the second thing is, if you submit to AFC court, you are subject to English High Court um, uh, civil procedure rules, uh, and uh, the proceedings will be in English because the judges are uh, English, uh, are British, uh, and. Uh, if you are submitting to the AFC arbitration, you are more flexible. You can choose uh, procedural rules uh, uh, in the way you want. You can choose language. You can choose arbitrators. They have a panel of arbitrators from whom you can, uh, among whom you can choose. But uh, but as I understand, you can also choose someone outside of the list of the recommended arbitrators. So basically, you can have it uh, have your hearing somewhere in Shimbalak in Almaty, but still uh, fall within the subject of uh, within the uh, jurisdiction of the AFC. Now, in this uh, era of, of COVID and all the restrictions, uh, can you have uh, remote hearings either at the court or at the arbitration portion of the AIFC? Yes, I think I think the, they they are doing them remotely currently. Um, uh, I I, um, I know that they didn't uh, adopt uh, any changes to their uh, regulations uh, relevant to online proceedings, but but I don't know I know that they they conduct online proceedings. Mm -hmm. Uh, and now, is it the case that the, the English judges uh, come to either Astana or Almaty to uh, to do this? Uh, well, at least before the COVID situation, they, they used to come. I don't know uh, how they're working currently. Mm -hmm. uh, but they usually attend hearings uh, when they have those here. Right. Uh, you, you mentioned the minus 40 degrees uh, at Astana. I, I suppose if it could be done remotely, you, you avoid that problem. Well, yes, uh, of course. Um, uh, but the court, uh, as I mentioned, is not too active at this stage. I think mm -hmm. it's mo mostly the arbitration. The arbitration side. Right. We have something in our chat. Uh, we have a question from Gene Bird. He says, I have a question if there are any specific issues with deciding applicable law in CIS arbitrations when parties did not choose one. Um, well, I think it's a matter of uh, really local law um, uh, and uh, local practices. Um, my my uh, personal personal observation, based on the analysis of uh, Russian law and Kazakh law, and you know, uh, one interesting thing is that uh, civil codes of uh, Russia and Kazakhstan are relatively similar. At least they they were same in 1994. So uh, because there is a lack of judicial practice in Kazakh courts, um, we usually look into what is happening in Russia, how Russian courts interpret uh, Russian mm -hmm. law, and uh, we find similar provisions in Kazakh code and, uh, and uh, apply it in, in the same way. So um, my, my overall observation from the analysis of uh, Russian law and practices is that um, Russia really gives you a considerably larger degree of predictability in terms of uh, overall civil law and, and particularly in uh, arbitration as well, except for maybe some extreme cases where um, things can go wrong. So uh, my personal observation is that maybe uh, AFC, law, uh, AFC arbitration could be like number one if you are going to CIS because it really closes major issues, although it hasn't been tested. And second probably is arbitration in, in, in Russia, I think. Um, I, I wouldn't, uh, I would go maybe for Kazakhstan, maybe third. And uh, in re replying to Jean Bird's question, uh, I, I think you really need to go in, into local law um, and, and see. I, I'm not an expert in Russian law, so really not in position to comment on that. From Kazakh law perspective, uh, the situation is relatively straightforward. You have um, a list of cases uh, where a local law is chosen, uh, and if you cannot specify its uh, law, which is most um, relevant to the situation, and then uh, you choose one. Mahid, uh, can I have a question, please, to you? Sure. Uh, this is Leonid Propotov. Um, hi, Leonid. Um, hi. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. 
And uh, uh, have you come across any um, precedents of enforcing uh, AIFC uh, arbitral awards in Russia or in other uh, CIS countries uh, so far? Well, we are in very close contact with uh, the register of the AAFC. Um, I, frankly speaking, I haven't heard of them enforcing uh, anything in Russia. Uh, uh, I know uh, absolutely that they enforced uh, judgments uh, in, uh, in Kazakhstan. They were relatively smooth. Um, but, but really no experience in relation to Russia. You know, I can go back and check uh, if, if, they, if they had one. And we could go back to you. Uh, if you sent me your email, I can get back to you on this. Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, any any experience with other CIS countries, uh, not only Russia. So uh, there there are a number of uh, those. I do understand that uh, AFC is uh, uh, pretty young arbitration center, right? But uh, right. maybe yeah. Okay. Um, um, we have. Well, frankly speaking, uh, as Peter coming in here, I think that uh, if you were considering, for example, Uzbekistan or uh, Tajikistan, um, you, you would be very, very concerned about the, the, the courts, uh, the, the question of political influence. Um, you, you really just don't know. Uh, and I, I think perhaps that uh, was a reason why the AIFC uh, was set up in the first place, um, was to take it out of a, the context of uh, local uh, judges and uh, politics and, and to try to, in effect, to sanitize it and make it uh, uh, standalone and uh, no longer subject to these influences. I mean, I, I guess I would be very concerned that in some of the other uh, CIS jurisdictions that um, you, you really don't know uh, going into it whether you are uh, going to be able to uh, successfully enforce an award. Right. Uh, we have a raised hand uh, from Islambik. Uh, Islambik, you can uh, turn on your microphone and raise a question if you, if you have one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon for everyone. I would just like to add about the Uzbekistan experience on that. Uh, maybe you know that in Uzbekistan were established a new international arbitration center. This is the Tashkent International Arbitration Center. It was established in 2019. Mm -hmm. as I remember, and uh, it has a good experience at time. It, there is more than 10 cases, which is ongoing cases at time. And uh, the Uzbekistan is also the arbitration friendly country, but there in our country, there was a um, law on domestic arbitration. Uh, but uh, last week, our parliament adopted a new law on international arbitration. And the Tashkent International Arbitration Center were established according to the presidential decree and have a good uh, basis for, the, for its activities. And all of its uh, awards are uh, enforced in Uzbekistan and also in Uzbekistan in its uh, civil procedural and economic procedural codes. There is uh, regulations of the enforcement of the international arbitration awards and I can say that according to the statistics that there is more than 90% of all international awards which comes to Uzbekistan are totally enforced. I would like just to add this about the Uzbekistan experience. Okay. Uh, well, thank uh, you. That, that, that's terrific. Uh, we very much appreciate your comments. Well, you know, we uh, in, in Kazakhstan really like Tashkent. You know, uh, have you been to Tashkent, Peter? Yes, I have, uh, but during the Soviet period. Okay, well, uh, uh, I haven't been in, in the Soviet period, but uh, I, I really love the city, so it would be great to, <laughs> you know, seriously to combine uh, Tashkent, uh, Plov, and local tea with uh, doing an arbitration. I think it would be great. Uh, in effect, that, that gets down to your final comment on, on your slide, uh, 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 restaurants, hotels, et cetera, and temperature. I'm, I'm sure that uh, people would be very interested in, in going to Tashkent for that purpose for the purpose of an arbitration. Please tell us about your experience. I mean, uh, in, 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 in soft factors, maybe uh, other panelists could also speak. Rupert, maybe you have uh, comments. Uh, what are the soft factors in, in choosing a seat of arbitration? Uh, 
Is there an, a place in, in the CIS which you would really love to visit and combine it with an arbitration? Uh, well, I, I, I always enjoy uh, visiting every country in the CIS, and I've, I've been to Tashkent, I've, I've been down the Silk Road, and if I ever uh, had an arbitration in, in Tashkent, I'd certainly take the opportunity to uh, retrace my steps down the Silk Road. But um, on a more practical basis, I think certainly um, the accessibility in terms of travel, uh, the easier it is to, to, for me to travel from, from, from London, um, in terms of flight connections as well as travel time, uh, that will that will be a, a factor. Of course, all of these issues need to be considered at the uh, at the at the contract stage, and, and it's got to be considered therefore usually by the corporate colleagues, who, if they're sensible, will will also discuss it with their dispute resolution colleagues. And I think that's something we uh, often overlook: is that these clauses are, are put in without this sort of sophisticated level of um, uh, thinking um, when it comes to choosing a, a seat, whether it's in the CIS or elsewhere. We haven't uh, discussed uh, Kiev. I happen to be doing uh, several arbitrations in Kiev, and I find that a, a very uh, a friendly place to, to visit, and uh, the accommodations are, are just fine, first class. Uh, uh, getting to and from uh, Kiev is not difficult, um, so, uh, you know, on, on that score, uh, I rate it very high. Okay, um, uh, dear panelists, uh, do you have uh, any experiences to share? Uh, and one of the key questions to me as, as, a, as a citizen of, this, of the CIS country is, uh, are there any other factors or maybe which are the key factors um, which could impact your decision to uh, choose uh, a place in the CIS as a uh, as a seat of arbitration? Is it only the regulation or maybe some other uh, factors which we didn't mention in our presentation during the session? Hi, Bakit, um, Conrad Rogers. I, Hi. I, didn't, I, um, I, I didn't particularly have um, further experience, Charlo. I, I found that discussion very interesting, but I'd be interested in your views and also the views of other panelists on the extent to which even after, well, obviously as the crisis continues, but even afterwards, that there's going to be a shift towards um, virtual hearings, because I think that's something that, that we're seeing discussed a lot in England going forward. And I think people's views have generally been fairly positive about how well, um, certainly in arbitration, the infrastructure has worked for these remote hearings and for these, for these virtual hearings. And rather than people having to take the time to, to travel and go these huge distances, and the, the additional costs involved. So I, I'd just be interested for, for your views on that. Well, um, I really, well, uh, you know, uh, I can speak of Kazakhstan and uh, in, in Kazakhstan, uh, AFC, I, I'm not uh, kind of promoting AFC arbitration, but I'm, I'm objectively comparing it with other arbitral institutions, uh, domestic ones. And uh, the AFC is really stands apart because it's financed by the state. Uh, they have a, very, very good, uh, you know, te technical uh, background, technical preparation, and uh, court hearings. And I think uh, they they probably stand equal, or maybe are very close to uh, Western uh, arbitral institutions in terms of facilities or in whatever. Um, local other um, uh, arbitral arbitral institutions are probably not. Um, in in terms of um, Online proceedings, you know, I, I need to go back and check uh, as to uh, whether they're considering uh, maybe uh, shifting to uh, online proceedings on a more or less permanent basis uh, over time. Um, didn't, didn't think about it. Um, well, let's see. You, uh, well, you know, I was, uh, I, I have been relatively conservative about uh, AAFC court, but uh, you know, I, I really try to find potential. Um, uh, weaknesses of it, uh, and I haven't found one, at least so far. I think that uh, we have, have entered a, a quite a revolution in arbitration in general, with uh, with the COVID restrictions and uh, the concurrent uh, moving to remote uh, aspects. I think that uh, uh, going forward, uh, certainly many of the things that precede the hearing, the date of the hearing, will be done remotely, and I think much more efficiently. Um, so, for example, the preliminary conferences 
uh, uh, requests for uh, discovery issues and the like. Uh, well, now I think, uh, regardless of whether we have restrictions, uh, pandemic restrictions going forward, they will be done remotely because um, the the idea of flying for uh, six or eight hours to to attend a, a three uh, or two hour uh, d discussion over some uh, uh, preliminary matter. Uh, will, doesn't make sense and will continue not to make sense. Uh, and I think that a lot of that will be done remotely. Um, so I, I think that uh, e even if we uh, go back to actual hearings, uh, that much of, of the arbitration process will be done uh, using technology, using video conferencing, and that um, if, for example, you have an arbitration in, uh, in Almaty, uh, that the only time people will go to Almaty will, will be for the actual hearing um, in a situation where we no longer have the pandemic restrictions. Uh, Which, of course, makes uh, uh, the, the possibility of, of doing these things uh, in places like Almaty much more attractive. Okay, Rupert has raised a hand. Rupert? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I could ask you, I've got a question for you, and it's about the AIFC. Uh, how busy is the AIFC at the moment? Um, how, many, how many cases uh, are being referred to it? Uh, and even if it is still a little bit early for cases to work their way through the pipeline, is it your experience at the moment that companies, whether state companies or private companies, are actually putting the AIFC uh, into their contracts? Well, uh, you know, uh, Kazakhstan is, a, is an authoritarian state. Uh, and uh, state companies are effectively be, are being forced to um, uh, introduce AFC clauses, uh, but um, I'm sure AFC um, um, management uh, will not be happy about me uh, about me telling this. But, but I mean, this is true. Uh, they are massively introducing AFC clauses into their contracts, uh, and I think it's just a matter of time when those arbitration clauses will um, uh, will be invoked. Uh, in terms of um, uh, their, um, uh, uh, how busy they are, at least they put on their website that, as I mentioned, they have 197 cases, um, uh, mediation and arbitration cases combined. How many of them are arbitrations? Uh, how large are they? I don't know because they don't disclose this information, but I think they are gradually uh, improving their workload and overall experience maybe. Um, uh, well, you know, I think you should uh, maybe look into uh, into the practicalities. For example, uh, um, my personal observation is that uh, you do not choose AFC for multi-billion dollar maybe disputes, uh, but for disputes which are economically more feasible to try to uh, refer uh, in, uh, in, in Astana, for example, uh, uh, economically or maybe for some other reasons, maybe because the parties are local. Uh, uh, it, it would be too expensive to, for everyone to travel to London. In, for that kind of cases, I think it could give you a really good alternative. It might, be, uh, might not be as good as maybe SEC, ICC or London in, in all other respects, uh, but, uh, but overall it could be not a bad uh, alternative. Um, uh, but again, uh, time will show. Uh, I don't know if I was able to reply to your question, Rupert. I, I see Leonid uh, has raised his hand. Leonid. Right, right. Yeah, um, uh, a related question actually, uh, Bahit, you have mentioned that um, uh, IFC uh, is put by state-owned uh, or state-related companies uh, in their arbitration agreements, and probably this is one of the sources uh, of uh, the caseload uh, for, um, uh, for for the century. Uh, but, uh, well, given the Russian experience uh, and also probably in some other CIS countries, the question is, uh, w given that the, cent the center is also uh, financed by the state, if I uh, got uh, you right, um, are there any um, speculations um, in uh, Kazakhstan on how this uh, work. Uh, so uh, the center is financed by the government and also uh, state-owned uh, entities are going to the center to... Uh, I got your question. Yeah. I got it. Uh, well, um, 
Yes, the center is uh, largely financed by the state, uh, if not entirely. Uh, and uh, there is, of course, risk that um, uh, policies of the state can change. Uh, AIC can no longer be supported by the state, maybe the new president. And as you know, uh, we have a new president in, in uh, presidential elections in the next maybe four or five years. Um, uh, everything can change. Um, but I think whether or not AFC will continue to exist, it will exist. Uh, whether it's going to be as supported as now, I don't know. Um, whether there is risk of uh, intrusion or maybe some influence on arbitrators or, uh, or the administration in terms of in, 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 if there are disputes, important disputes involving the state, I really personally doubt that it could happen because uh, the, the AIFC court uh, consists is comprised of uh, uh, judges uh, who have serious experience uh, in, in the UK. Uh, unless they start supporting the Kazakh government, I don't know. Um, uh, and uh, you can choose the arbitrators. So um, um, from that perspective, I really don't know how you can, for example, influence an experienced foreign arbitrator to uh, try your case, who, who was appointed by you, by yourself. So um, from that perspective, I really don't see uh, a risk of maybe some um, uh, influence. Uh, I don't hear, I don't listen, uh, well, I, I don't, I haven't heard of anyone really complaining about this. Uh, most of the complaints concerned with um, lack of experience with a AIFC, the people really don't know uh, how it's going to work out in practice. They don't want to be tested. Uh, uh, and that's why they simply take the position, let's just try LCA because it has existed forever and it's going to work. But, you know, uh, I had a case just two days ago uh, I have a client who, who has a major insolvency case, um, a major debt recovery case. Uh, um, they have claims against the Kazakh company for $180 million. Uh, they have basically two routes. I, uh, they have an arbitration clause which refers to LCIA. If they, they go the arbitration route, they will spend one year in the arbitration. And by the time they will come to Kazakhstan, uh, there will be no assets left. Uh, and uh, even if they get the award from the LCIA, the, the, the debtor is an influential per person in this country, and uh, it's possible that that arbitral award will not be enforced for whatever reason. So um, in, in a situation like that, I think uh, what uh, AAFC offers you, the, the, the fact that the arbitral award of the AAFC will have the effect of the Kazakh state judgment, I think it's a better option. Um, but is it better overall? I don't know, really. May I just comment that on, on the issue of uh, state financing, uh, Singapore uh, finances Maxwell Chambers, and Maxwell Chambers is certainly highly regarded. So I think that the, the mere fact of state support uh, uh, isn't necessarily dispositive of uh, how the center will operate. Okay, any other comments, any other views? <clears throat> uh, just another comment uh, about Singapore. Uh, you know, many years ago, uh, before Maxwell Chambers uh, became so well known and recognized and uh, appreciated, the same comments were uh, were being made. I mean, how can you really uh, rely upon what Singapore does? Is they're not going to be influenced from the government and all? And uh, the experience there shows that uh, a center can develop and can gain world class reputation as being uh, honest, straightforward, efficient. And a place in which to arbitrate. We have a comment from Islamic, from Uzbekistan. Yeah, thank you very much. I would like just to add that there is a good perspective for CIS countries uh, in this way of arbitration, because at time in CIS we don't have such a centers which is uh, very popular. And but the connection and the situation in CIS and the countries are making the business with foreign countries, etc. And in this regard, uh, there is a good opportunity that the business uh, entities, etc., in their international commercial relations will put the arbitration clauses of the uh, neighboring countries. Because in our mentality and in during the business activities, most companies wouldn't like to have their case in that country in which they are making business or their partner are situated. So because of that, there is a perspective like uh, in the companies from Uzbekistan who are making business with Russia, they can choose the uh, Nur Sultan, so Astana as a 
place for arbitration like AFC arbitration. And also there's a perspective in such regard that the Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and others who are making business with uh, related countries, neighboring countries could choose the Tashkent, Uzbekistan as an arbitration place. And I think this is the main perspective at time. And it was mentioned that there is a needed time that these arbitration centers should show their practice, should show their experience and to become more popular. And in this regard, other countries will be interested to solve their cases in these places. And one of the maybe positions of to, to come to these countries are to see these countries like in Uzbekistan. And if we will take Tashkent, it was mentioned that uh, it's always people like to come here because a good weather, a good infrastructure, a good food and places where you can go, you can visit like a tourist. So I think this is also interesting situation because uh, this is also in Singapore. When you go to Singapore, you always know that you can visit some places, you have get fun, etc., etc. And I think Islam this is also the issue to the develop of the arbitration and uh, to show that the country are arbitration friendly and people could get all, could get also fun and they will have the places to go if they will come to this place. Uh, Islam, thank you. Comment. Do you have? Uh, I mean, uh, could could you please share your observations on on uh, Uzbekistan arbitration law? Do you have any? Uh, strange provisions. For example, in, in our Kazakh law, uh, which doesn't apply to AIC, we have uh, things like the principle of uh, legitimacy. Uh, it's a weird thing, but um, yeah, there is a speculation that uh, an arbitral award can be cancelled on the basis that it, it, it's uh, it's erroneously drafted from uh, from the perspective of law. So, uh, and it can potentially lead to a uh, cancellation or things things like that. Do you have anything like that in your law? At least, have, have you heard of it? Oh, at time, uh, I was in the working group who prepared, which prepared this uh, law, uh, but I haven't seen the last version, which were adopted by the Senate last week. Uh, it should uh, be signed by the president this week, and then I can tell I can tell you that what they it's have. But uh, when it was ready, we sent it to the ANSI trial, and they proved that it's totally correct according to the model law and there wasn't such uh, definitions or rulings which are not mentioned in the model law. Great. So it is mo mostly based on mo model law. You know, well, we had a similar case in early 1990s where if you look at uh, Kazakh laws uh, drafted in the early 90s, they were really very liberal. And then when the oil money came, they have become very authoritarian. So I hope that Uzbekistan will not follow the same route and then your laws will really stay uh, as they are currently. I think we have two minutes left. Uh, I think we do maybe some uh, say thanks to the participants, uh, you know, to avoid the weird uh, situation, to uh, awkward situation of uh, everything turned off. Well, let me say that uh, this has been a terrific uh, discussion and I think we have certainly met the organizers request that we have a participatory session. Um, I've learned a lot. Uh, uh, particularly from uh, Islambek about what's going on in Uzbekistan, uh, it's, it's great. This is the way uh, seminars should be conducted because uh, each of you uh, has experience that uh, benefits all of us. So I want to thank all of you. Uh, thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think we still have just one minute left. If anyone has any comments in relation to uh, the latest development in Russia, please let us know. Uh, and we really enjoyed the session as well. So, any 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 other other comments? I think no. We I think we don't have any further comments. Well, okay, uh, Peter. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your company um, and uh, everyone else. Bakud, I I support that. I enjoyed very much working with you. It, it's terrific that in this day and age, we can uh, cover ten hours of time zones in an instant uh, and uh, meet people around the world. Uh, as I say, this development is going to be with us for a very long time and it's going to change arbitration tremendously. Right. Okay. Uh, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye. I'm sorry, my, my camera turned off and it's not turning on, so I cannot show my <laughs> hand. We may all now leave the meeting.
Right. Uh, I, I, I'm just trying to uh, put down an uh, email address from uh, Leonid Kropotov, uh, copy it to get back on the AIC. Good. Statistics. We have a new message. Okay. Okay. Now I need to learn how to put everyone outside of the <laughs> of the room. We we will be cut off in just a minute. Okay. So I'm turning off 